MSNBC's Joanne Reed appeared emotional on air last night when discussing just how personal and meaningful Donald Trump's mugshot is to her. Let's watch. So as a teenager living in New York, I, I've said it before, this is the reason I never watched The Apprentice. Yeah. I despised Donald Trump yeah. because he, to me, signified the rich white guy in Manhattan that absolutely hated and despised me, yeah. that hated and despised my cousins, my friends, everyone we knew, that, that, that called us wilding yeah. just because we were in the park, that said we can't be free to walk around in the street, that said when Patrick Dorisman got killed by an off-duty police officer, he's no choir boy. And he was literal. I mean, was no altar boy. He was literally an altar boy. Giuliani said that. And so people like Giuliani and people like Trump persecuted black and brown people in New York. It's what they did for fun. It's what they did for pleasure. They enjoyed it. They enjoyed lording over people who had nothing, who had no million dollar lawyers, who couldn't change lawyers at the drop of a hat and get a different hip hop lawyer the next day when they were tired of one, who couldn't go out and make their case on, you know, Fox or on Newsmax, who had nothing and who Donald Trump lorded his everything over and still people who looked like them put him in rap songs. It was an indignity to me that something I loved, a culture I love would lionize that. And so to me, this is justice. The fact that Manhattan didn't give him a mugshot, I thought was offensive. And I thought that the Fed said, we already know what he looks like. He was the president of the United States. Okay, offensive. Everyone else had to take him. This case, and I think Fonnie Willis is a hero. She is a national hero because she, more than any prosecutor in this country, and I respect Jack Smith and I respect all the prosecutors that are doing this, she's the only one who said these wealthy, powerful, privileged, men and women are just American citizens. Well, um, you know, I don't know. There's a lot to unpack. Everybody's entitled to their opinions for transparency. I know Joy Reid personally, and I respect um, her right to articulate her experience in terms of how she views Donald Trump and Rudy Giuliani. But I, I, I have a bit of a different approach or perspective on this. I mean, in 1999, uh, Jesse Jackson gave a speech, and he was quoted in thanking Donald Trump for everything he's done for the black community. You look at Donald Trump in, in the 80s, and he was a Democrat at the time, gave a significant amount of money to Democrat Democratic uh, political leaders and, and, and Democratic-leaning organizations. Most African Americans typically vote Democrat. And so I think Donald Trump's history in terms of race is, is, is very complex and nuanced, as it is for many people in his age group. Uh, but I, I'm just not necessarily sure if I would cast this or cast Fonnie Willis as a national hero. I, I would just somewhat see that a little differently, Jess. Yeah, I, I can't speak to how it would feel to be a member of the black community and see Donald Trump's rise to power and how he and his cronies used it. But I can speak to what it meant to be a working class person and to grow up looking at a figure like Donald Trump. You know, growing up in a neighborhood of people who work with their hands to pay their mortgages, uh, parents who don't have college degrees. What Donald Trump meant to us, people who do contract work, construction work to pay their mortgage and keep a roof over their kids' heads and food on the table. He was a guy who had so much money from his father that he created a real estate empire. And when he had people come and do contract work for him, and do construction work and carpentry work in those buildings, for him to find minor things wrong with the work and then not pay the workers who completed the job and not have the lawyers to sue for the money that they were owed, that meant for a lot of people not paying their mortgage, losing their houses, not putting food on the table for their kids. And for someone with so much money and so much privilege to do that on a regular basis, and I grew up 45 minutes outside of Manhattan, a lot of people worked in Manhattan, a lot of people worked for projects that Donald Trump, his company, was overseeing. And so for that to be this figure that claims to represent and speak for the populist working class, that's why I don't like Donald Trump. That's why my family didn't watch The Apprentice. That's why the people who grew up in neighborhoods like mine don't like guys like that. To get so rich off of the backs of other people, to steal their labor and treat them like they're expendable and like they're nothing because they don't have as much money as him, that's treating people like they're less than human beings. And so does seeing him get treated like everybody else in the eyes of the law feel a little bit good for everyone who grew up witnessing that culture? Yeah, it does. So I can see where Joanne Reed is coming from 
a little bit with that sentiment and what Donald Trump rep represents for people who grew up working class in the tri-state area. Yeah, and see, and, and that's goes to my point. Everything you just said, just about the nuance and complexity of Trump as a figure, as a cultural phenomenon. I mean, here's a guy who received a significant portion of the white working class vote. And you just talked about your own experiences growing up in a working class family. Uh, here's a guy in, in pop culture and, and hip hop music was in many ways idolized. Everyone wants to be as wealthy as Trump. I want money like Trump. And then at the same time, you have to unpack Trump in terms of race. You have to unpack Trump in terms of not paying people wages and, and, and what the, the end result of that and impact was on those families and communities. And so uh, he's a complex figure. I, I think it's like what Nikki Haley said, that Trump is a person that you either like or you hate. I don't think you're going to find too many people in between. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. I think the mugshot itself a cultural phenomenon because it's funny because he's making a ridiculous face. But I think the indictment of Donald Trump is, is justice for a lot of people just because we've seen him negotiate bond payments. We've seen him go into the court uh, and just pay the pre-negotiated bond in terms of his indictment, leave, have no court date. And I think most everyday people know that that process of arraignment is very different. Uh, most people have to spend the weekend in jail. Then they have a hearing. They're appointed a public defender that barely knows their case, picks up the paperwork for it moments before. They don't have a pre-negotiated bond and then bond is set at a number that they usually cannot afford. And they're stuck to stay in jail until it's time for their hearing. Donald Trump's experience is just so different from the average American. And so seeing him just get a mugshot, which is a normal thing, I can see how some people would say that has an impact, but just the fact that he's being indicted and not being able to settle this out of court, I think is, is something that is justice in and of itself, just to see someone of that power actually have to have to answer for what he's done. This is not something he can buy himself out of, like all these contracts he got out of paying his workers for. It's not going down like that. And I, and I think that's why some people feel a sense of justice here as well. But you know what you can't overlook, despite all everything you just laid out? Donald Trump is leading the Republican field of eight other candidates. If you look at national polling, Donald Trump and, and President Joe Biden are literally in a statistical dead heat. You look at the exit results uh, from the battleground states in 2020, and President Biden won across four or five states with merely 81,000 votes that ultimately gave him the presidency. So despite all of these things, there is clearly a plethora of Americans out there beyond just right-leaning individuals who do like something about Trump, and maybe they like the policies and not the man. But again, we can't just dismiss those things. I think that just speaks to how devoid the political field is from people who represent everyday Americans. And I think that's also the product of how difficult it's become if you grow up working class in the United States to even get to the point of going to college, to even get to the point where you have the political experience that justifies a run for president, to have the public presence, to garner the amount of donations necessary to run a successful political campaign to the point where you get the recognition and donations necessary to appear on a debate stage. And so there's very clear reasons that are systemic ones as to why we don't see people who are representative of everyday Americans reaching the point of even running for president, let alone getting on the debate stage or receiving public attention so their ideas are heard. So I think Donald Trump's success is more of the result of a system that is terribly broken than it is him being an exceptional person. And yet many working class people do believe that Donald Trump speaks to them. How, 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 do, you, how do you register that, I suppose? I mean, you, you travel across the country and people say he is speaking for me in terms of wanting to dismantle the bureaucratic state. Uh, he's speaking for us when he goes to NATO and say other countries need to pay more. Uh, he's speaking for us when he's defending the blue collar worker in middle America that both Republicans and Democrats have forgotten. Those sentimentalities are there, whether Donald Trump is the perfect or imperfect arbiter of them. That's a whole separate conversation. But I don't think you can dismiss what millions of Americans like about him as an individual, as a political person and, and why so many of them continue to stand by him just despite four indictments despite 91 individual charges. It's why when you look at Joe Biden and Donald Trump, people are kind of like, I don't know which one I'm going to vote for. You would think to everything you laid out, 
that that would not indeed be the case. But yet it is. And so I think we need to really understand the position of millions of Americans and what they see in Trump and what he embodies for them. I wouldn't dismiss it. I worked for political campaigns and went door to door knocking, talking to people who vote for Donald Trump, working class people. And it's very clear that most people, even those who vote for Donald Trump, do so because of a lack of options, because the political class is what it is. And when we think about who's voting for president at all, at most 60% of the country participates. Of those, 30% of the country is casting a ballot for Donald Trump, if that. He did not win the popular vote the last time around. So when we think of what a small percentage of the country in that act country that actually is, that is working class and voting for Donald Trump, it's nowhere near a majority of the working class. Most people who are working class don't believe in our political process at all. And when they vote, they don't have time to be fully informed about the political platform that the candidate's running on because they're working day in and day out trying to provide for their families. They don't have time to pay attention to every single political issue. It's not about them being smart enough. It's simply about them working so hard that they don't have time to participate at the same level as other people, those who do vote. And so Donald Trump was someone who I think garnered some of the working class vote simply because he was speaking out against the political class. But when he got into office, he governed as an elitist and he lost the second time around, I think as a consequence of that. He promised to drain the swamp. He promised to do things for working class people and then he got into the office and didn't keep any of his campaign promises. He cut taxes for the wealthy and he made the promise that that would make life better for working class people. And it didn't. We saw the same wage stagnation that we saw before Donald Trump. We saw union busting at record levels, working class people trying to organize for better working conditions. And we saw working people lose their job during the pandemic and struggle to make ends meet. So I don't think he's a working class hero, even if he gets some of the working class vote. And if you were to ask people, are they better off under Joe Biden? They would probably say no. The Harris Harvard poll came out two months ago, showcased people believe that they're worse off. They believe the country is going in the incorrect direction. Uh, they are worried about their pockets. They are worried about their inability to save more. They do look at inflation and crime and other things and say, you know, I thought this was going to be better. I thought electing Biden was going to move us in a different direction. And millions of Americans are saying this isn't it either. And so I think in terms of having two different individuals represent two major parties in this country, to your point, Jess, does not give the American people enough options. And I think, again, when you think about Joy and, and some of her comments, there are many people who look at Trump as this really complex character that you like him or you hate him. But overall, it points to one general consensus, and that is most people are not happy about the direction of the country or the options we have to lead the country. That does it for us today, this week on Rising. Jess, it was great to be here with you today. Yep. Another good show with you, Sir Michael. Another Rising Friday. For those of you who like to listen on the go, make sure you are subscribing so you never miss any content and you can listen to us anywhere you get your podcast. We're now available anywhere. We'll see you soon. Take care, Jess. Bye, y'all.